when you when you're ready. Yes. Let me know. Okay. Well, I'm you. Okay, you are John Tennant. Right? Hi. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's, let's start. Uh, so I'm here in uh, Hatun Tinkui in Lima, Peru, and I'm here with John Tennant. Hi, John. Nice to meet you. How are you, How are you doing? Good to meet you again. <laughs> I'd like you to uh, introduce the topic of your talk mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, I was invited here to talk about the global state of open science. Mm -hmm. So, open science is this sort of global phenomenon now, which is really kicking off. Um, and it's a very complex and fragmented and unusual landscape involving a lot of bottom up initiatives and a lot of top down sort of policies and mandates. Um, and I've been very lucky in the last few years to experiences at a number of different levels uh, around the world. So I came here and I feel very privileged to be invited to, to, to come to Peru. Like it's a very rare opportunity, yeah. I feel. So I came here with the intention of being honest. And I didn't know if I'm here like uh, a European sort of savior and say that what we're doing in Europe has all of the answers to all the problems that we face. Um, and I also didn't want to come down here and be very patronizing and say, oh, everything in Latin America is very perfect. Mm -hmm. So, my intention was to explore the differences between the states in Latin America and Europe and see where we've been going wrong and how we can work together uh, better to solve the problems that we face. For example, to do with the commercialization of knowledge, um, how to do sustainable open access publishing, and all of these sorts of things. Very good. And what's your take on the idea of applying the plan S or something like it as a one fits all answer to Latin America? Uh, yeah, I think I think again this is this is the problem uh, because plan S I think has the right intentions. It's based on very strong principles, but the implementation of it in Europe at least is going to be geared towards protecting many elements of the solar energy industry that we have today and which we know are fairly dysfunctional. They're owned by companies that do not have the best interests of the research community in mind just because of the way it's set up historically. Um, and I think trying to impose that on Latin America or indeed any other place around the world isn't necessarily the right approach to take. And I think instead we need to be more introspective and about what it, where it is we're coming from, from a sort of planet European focus plan as perspective. And then let's have a look at what's been happening around Latin America and other places in terms of the success. So we have in Latin America Redolink, Cielo, and all of these great platforms which have been doing fantastic work now for almost two, uh, two decades. And we have uh, America, which is sort of the counterpoint to, to planning the planet. And for me, personally, it seems to be a much more well thought out, society driven. Um, Sort of principles and practices and implementations that are much more aligned with the values and the principles of good school implementation. And Cielo and these uh, key players in Latin America have also strived to uh, create a, a system that is old by now, mm -hmm. oh, as many years, more than a decade at least, and uh, they, they have tried to make open access, uh, get open access to research from the origin, or at least in all stages of research. But, uh, when you know that uh, Cielo is uh, uh, all you can download, it's for free for the user, right? So uh, perhaps the plan S doesn't make too much sense as we have uh, already those systems in place. Yeah, it feels like Latin America is sort of where plan S would want to be in 15 years. You know, Planus is clearly a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. But instead of trying to impose that set of practices and values on something which, in my view, is already far more progressive, doesn't make really that much sense. And I would actually call for those who are in charge of Planus to step back and stop trying to impose it on Latin America. And instead say, actually, what you've been doing works really well. What can we learn from you and take back to Europe and North America and the rest of the world as we advance? And, and uh, be much more progressive. Yeah, and it's uh, less patronizing uh, attitudes towards Latin America, right? Because the, we have uh, good experiences mm -hmm. that can be taken far north. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think part of it is an attitude uh, yeah. and, you know, in the Western world, we do seem to have that a little bit <laughs> yeah. too much. So, yeah, this is why, again, like, this is such a beautiful opportunity and a great conference for COLA. You know, I, I really look forward to taking back what I've learned here, taking back to the, the, the spreading of the world. Sure.
that will be great. Mm -hmm. And uh, talking about the commercialization of science, what's your take on science and those Sorry. disruptive forces to the industry? Yes, uh, so science. It's, uh, it's like we have this thing called the new market, uh, so there's a lot of luck we hit it. And uh, <laughs> It tends to polarize views depending on how you view access and scholarly publishing. Mm -hmm. So I think the best thing to do when thinking about sci-hub is to ask why it exists in the world. Now, the reason sci-hub exists is because the scholarly publishing industry has failed to do its task of making scholarly research public. Right, so sci-hub is not a uh, cure, it's a symptom of the wider disease that we have in, in, in publishing. It's a consequence of, exactly. of a system that has lived for too long and mm -hmm. has maintained practices exactly. for too a very long period. And if you if you if you look at the uh, the people behind it, like Alexandra, and you ask them why does it exist, she's not looking for money or fame or recognition. She's in it because she believes that providing access to scientific knowledge is generally good for the world, mm -hmm. and she's filling a gap there which the industry has failed to uh, to. But, but provide alternatives. Yeah, sure. But at the same time, we can't rely on it. It's mm -hmm. not sustainable. That's right. You know, it could shut off at any minute. And despite the number of mirrors around the world, if it disappears, then all of a sudden we're going to be left with a, a huge gap. Mm -hmm. And as well as that, I think that it's also a little bit dangerous because what it does, it's very similar to research aid. It provides a cheap, easy shortcut towards open access. Mm -hmm. But it's not sustainable. And by doing that, it actually detracts from the imperative for researchers to do things like self-archive their work. You know, I'm talking to a lot of researchers now in, in Europe in particular, and they say, why bother posting a version of the article on the it's already the there. if Saigon is going to have it already? And I think that's, that's a very dangerous precedent. So I think the, the reason why it exists is much more important than what it is potentially going to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think so. Very good points. And also, you know, I think more fundamentally, you know, the fact that it's being sued mm -hmm. um, by Elsevier and the American Chemical Society, amongst others, you know, for copyright infringement, I think that in itself raises some interesting questions because if the principles of sci are to provide access to knowledge and that is illegal, then we have to question why the copyright system is being in the way of that prevents access to knowledge when that is against the fundamental reason why it exists. Um, so, that's why I, in, in class, I try to distinguish the copyright the way as companies see them, because it's the right to copy, mm -hmm. and something different is the right of the author. Mm -hmm. And these things get very much confused. And uh, in, in Spanish, it's a, it's a challenge because uh, we translate copyright to propiedad intelectual, mm -hmm. and uh, that is a uh, a more ambiguous term, even than copyright, mm -hmm. and so uh, we tend to use the, the copyright uh, anglicism mm -hmm. in order to refer to the rights of the companies. Sure. In, in this in this field. Yeah, I mean it's, it's confusing. But one thing I would love, really, really love, is if researchers all over the world were trained more in the impacts of copyright of intellectual property of licensing, because at the moment I feel it's one of the sort of uh, most important elements of scholarly communication. Very. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 